Hello, today I will be showing you how to take the engine and gearbox out of this DS. It's got a suspected head gasket failure and in order to do a new, lot of other jobs, given that the engine hasn't been uh, checked out before, I'll be removing the engine and box as a unit and then having it on the bench where we can then work on it. Um, and we've already started, as you see the engine car's on the hoist, we've already taken off the exhaust system from underneath, the front wheels, the under tray and drained the engine and gearbox from oil. So, here we go. So, here we are um, going to remove the nuts holding the triax onto the, of the drive shaft onto the brake. Here is the triax, which is part of the drive shaft. This is the triax housing which holds um, the balls which allow the drive shaft to articulate. This triax is bolted through the disc and into the gearbox on, onto the drive shaft half shaft of the drive shaft and it's held with these nuts and they're done up pretty tight. On the early car of which this uh, this is a pre-67 car this is the design of the triax which allows you access directly onto the nuts from the front which is why I'm going to be doing it this way. The later design is slightly more awkward and it's a much larger um, housing here and so the access to the nuts is difficult and so you probably have to do it with a, a spanner rather than a windy gun and a socket like I'm going to use here. I'll have to rotate the wheel round to get at the next two, which is a little stiff on this car. So we undo two at a time and then turn the wheel round to gain access and drop the nuts in the process. When you come to do these nuts up, they need to be up to 130 newton meters, which is very tight and it's not easily done. Okay, in order to remove the drive shaft, the hub um, is held, the drive shaft part plate is held onto the hub with these two screws. So they have to be removed in order to allow the drive shaft to slide away from the gearbox so we can take the engine and gearbox out. So what happens here is the whole drive shaft can slide through the middle of the hub and so I'm just pulling it off so that the drive shaft comes off the studs on the engine side and that's as far as I need to take it in this instance. Drive shaft is now free, we can get the engine and gearbox out the top. So, as you can see, we've now taken off the wings of the, of the car and we've removed the duct for the radiator and we have drained the coolant into this side and we're also drilling the LHS into a container on the other side. And what we're now going to do is to work on this side of the car and the first thing we're going to take off is the air cleaner box here and then we're going to work our way down, work, taking bits off, the, off the, this side of the car and then we'll go around and do the same on the other side and then also from the front by removing the radiator. So, first thing to come off is the air, air cleaner and it's held on with two nuts on studs onto the exhaust manifold and they generally seize in place when they're original so it's a good tip if you are going to replace them is to put either replace these nuts not with steel ones but either put stainless steel or brass or even copper which are all available as nuts the idea there being that the, as the nut is a different material to the stud, uh, you don't get it seizing on so easily, even in the heat. Access, of course, is um, in the typical Citroen style, i.e. awkward. I have assumed the uh, position in attempting to get to the nut on the rear of the uh, air cleaner. I could make my life easier by actually taking the top of the air cleaner off uh, but why, why make life easy? I'm just managing to get my fingers onto it. And there it is now off and nearly dropped. I'll now undo those screws and take off the clean top. Uh, 
add glasses so we can see what I'm doing. Don't drop, don't drop a bit. <laughs> In the typical, it won't undo. Okay, here we go. This cause this car's got extra Jubilee clips on various clamps, which aren't entirely necessary, but always no harm. Ex extra security. There we go. Just slacken off the main clamp. And then you can unpop the uh, top of the air cleaner with the three clips. And the whole thing should lift off. I've done that. I've done that slightly wrong. I didn't have to unpop the top of the clips. Because it will come off the studs because I've just taken the bolts out. Highly professional, showing what I've done before. So now I've removed the air cleaner, I can now get access to the heat shield, which covers the exhaust manifold. And the reason uh, I'm going to take it off is just to get access down to the engine mount bolts at the back here. The, the rear one is in particularly awkward to get at, and uh, the heat shield actually restricts you actually getting your hand in there. So again, this has got a similar issue with the uh, air cleaner in that the bolts can tend to seize if they haven't been off for a while because of the heat emanating from the exhaust manifold. Also, uh, again, replacing any steel nuts with either brass, copper or stainless steel ones is a good idea. You've got two different sizes of nuts. You've got these two little M5 bolts at either end, studs, which are part of the inner heat shield and are therefore captive, captive studs. And then you've got two, again, steel studs going straight into the exhaust manifold, which have your normal, normal for DS that is, uh, M7 nuts on them. The heat shields can be of different materials. This one's aluminium, but the Citroen also produced them in steel. Uh, steel, of course, rots, even though it's, it'll be galvanised. Uh, again, it's depending on the age of your particular heat shield. And you may find that with these big studs, the M7s, uh, if they are particularly seized, you can actually quite easily shear them off, which is a complete pain because then you have to drill out the stud, which probably means removing the exhaust manifold, which you don't really want to have to do if you weren't planning on doing it. As this car, as, as we're pulling the engine and gearbox out of this car entirely, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter so much because we're going to have, have access to the exhaust manifold in the future anyway. But in this instance, the nuts are all coming off quite easily. Although I will be replacing them with stainless ones when we get there. So, you may have to be slightly nasty to the heat shield to get it over the studs because it's distorted over time. As I am slightly struggling now. And then work it, work it up and away. And there we go, heat shield off. Right, so I'm now going to take off the centrifugal regulator. This um, is, is the part that actually acts as the clutch as you um, set off from rest. It's um, relatively complicated in the way it's plumbed in. It's got a, a fixed unit here with fixed steel pipes. So it's a little bit involved and there will be a bit of dribbling of LHM, LHS in this instance. So I'll just work through the procedure of just undoing all the various nuts to remove it and then we can get down to the LHS pump underneath, which we also have to remove. For this, this is the tensioning bracket for the belt, and 
there should be a square washer here. There is a square washer, but that's, that's a non-standard washer. I'll, I shall be replacing that later. Uh, it's normal to find on cars, that, of course, that have been, um, uh, which of course they're all several years old, and so it's normal to find that uh, fixings are incorrect or more different. But provided they're doing the job, like this one instance, there should be a washer over here. This is this is going into a rubber bush, and um, the nut is not able to do its job properly. Not that this is a fault on the owner, of course. This is just the way it is. Not that I'm seeking to criticise you, note. Okay, this would now allow us to slacken the, the belt. I'm just forcing it down on the pivot. And that's the removal of the drive belt. Right. Mm. <laughs> Yes, that, that bolt's not very in very nicely. I'm going to slacken off the main pivot bolt on the uh, centrifugal regulator, which is 17 mil, a large 17 mil nuts and a bolt across it. <coughs> this one has been packed out with washers. To space it, but we'll correct that when we when we do the final assembly. There's a lot of access is, as usual, difficult to get at. <coughs> because it's a Citroen, sir, and I'm just going to get myself a suitable socket. Now there will be some spillage of hydraulic fluid, even though we've already taken off the, slackened off the regulator pressure. And as this is LHS, I want to minimize the leakage because LHS being corrosive will take off paint and it's generally not very nice stuff to have all over your car. Oh, <laughs> yes, okay. There's uh, a few little errors here, which will be corrected on the rebuild. When you, if you've not done this before and you come to take it apart, it is obviously a good idea to take a picture with your modern smartphone before you actually take anything off, thereby making it easy and you have a reference to rebuild it correctly. This. I will say that this isn't this isn't the uh, I wouldn't look on this one as the as the way to uh, what the car should look like because it's slightly incorrect in the way it's been reinstalled. But when we have it rebuilt, uh, hopefully I'll be able to show you the Citroen way of how it would be put together. In this instance, we have several homemade spaces, such as that one. Uh, doing their job, which is fine, but it's just, it isn't as Citroen intended. This is, uh, this is me splitting the pipe here. This actually goes down to the clutch lock. And as usual in this, you just need to wiggle them slightly for them to come apart, like that. Um, Okay, we'll put that back onto there. And cut this off the top. 
And here we now have some dribbling because I'm allowing air into the top and I'm dropping a nut. The other vital tool that you always have in any Citroen DS garage is a magnet on a stick. That's probably a part number for Citroen for it. But I'm not too bothered in this instance because we're pulling the engine out and I'll be able to pick up anything I do drop. This is, I'm now releasing the clamps for these return lines, which go back to the um, reservoir. Uh, these are low pressure, low pressure returns, just essentially, uh, not under any pressure, but are a bit stiff. That doesn't want to come off, does it? In theory, <laughs> that should just just lift off, but it doesn't want to. It certainly won't be leaking. So just in order to try and free off the pipe, I'm just going to rotate it there with the pliers. And there we go. And I'm going to lift it, hold it vertically upwards such that any LHS in the pipe will drain into the tank and hopefully not dribble everywhere. I'll just thread it through. There we go. All right, we have another one, which Again, might leak a bit. There we go. Just dribbling a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to have all of the pipes off. Apart from one going down to the oops down to the CRC. It's all slightly fiddly. Right now here we have the the centrifugal regulator is now virtually free. I just need to take out the main pivot bolt and catch the spaces as they fall. There we go. Here we go, and a spacer has now landed on the floor. Okay, so there's the centrifugal regulator off. Okay, so I've now removed the centrifugal regulator from that side in order to get access to the pump. We've taken off the air cleaner and the heat shield for the exhaust in order to get access down into the rear of the rear engine mount. And now we've moved across to this side of the car. We're going to take off the battery uh, and the battery tray, and then along with uh, the drained LHS uh, reservoir here. And then we'll be able to get to the bottom hose and remove the radiator, having already drained the coolant. So in normal fashion, taking off the battery, you always disconnect the earth lead first to prevent any electric shocks. This car's also got an extra little isolator switch, which is always a nice little idea. And in this one, we've also got the earth lead. And this earth lead will go down to the chassis somewhere. I don't quite know where this one's gone. Um, we will have to disconnect it from here. Once again, when a car is non-standard, which quite a lot of DSs are, uh, wires have been put in different positions like this one doing the job perfectly well but uh, not as Mr Citroen had them again not, not a real issue uh, it just means that we have to be slightly more versatile when dismantling or, or replacing everything okay so that's the earth lead off 
Now the um, positive terminal, which in this instance has got the solenoid relay for the starter motor on it. This one, this one is closed right up. If you can see, if you can see in the film there, you can see that the clamp is uh, right up tight and the bolts down up, and we can improve this by taking the bolt out and you can actually take a, a cut, take a sliver of uh, lead out in order to be able to get the clamp back. The other technique is when you're putting this back onto the battery is to actually tap it down first with a hammer to open up that and allow yourself a bit more clamp. Okay, it's got a couple of rubber insulators which is always a good idea to, so that you don't have any possibility of um, connecting direct to the earth frame. So that's the clamps off. Now we just need to take off both of these, slacken off the support brackets. They should both be 11 mil. Yes. Now the front one here, uh, the stud is, in theory, should be fixed in place. It's, they're both actually J bolts, which hook into uh, part of the clamp at the bottom. This one it seems to be fixed in solid with a, a bolt. Again, not a problem. And the rear one, also being a J bolt, which it is, what I would do normally here is slacken off the J bolt and then unhook it. But this one has been fixed, fixed in with a, a split pin, so I can't do that. Again, same issue with this is how other people have modified their cars to suit what they want. Also at the front of this one here, you've got the pipes, the return pipes, and you have, um, sorry, you have the feed pipe from the uh, reservoir to the pump, which goes through a clamp on, as part of the uh, bracket support. Now the way to dismantle that is not, I dis displace it by bending it slightly so that the thing comes out slightly to one side. As we've already drained the tank, taking out the filter housing here, carefully, you'll find it at the bottom, it doesn't want to come up through the hole, but it is already empty. And we now need to put that out of the way somewhere so it doesn't cause any issues. Again, being LHS, I want to be a little bit more careful about the possibility of dripping onto paintwork. All slightly awkward. Right, so now we've taken off both clamp bolts. The battery holding tray should slide off the top, which it does. There is a hook down on this side as part of the top, which holds a couple of wires and also the speedo cable, which I've just unhooked, allowing me to lift this up and hopefully it should come away with the wiring. As you can see, it's all slightly awkward. And ideally, you'd want to be able to fold this unit out of the way onto the engine so that you then have clear access to the battery. I'm making a bit of a meal of that. Anyway, there you go, battery is now free and you can just lift the battery out. So at the bottom of the battery, you have a plastic tray, which again is just to catch any drips, and then you have the steel frame underneath. I can now see at the uh, radiator bottom hose, and I'm now going to undo that and take off the radiator. Okay, so I'm taking, these are the return pipes that we took off previously, and as you can see, we put some bolts in the end just to stop further leakage. And I'm just going to tuck them out of the way here onto the top of the tank just so that they're out of the way, whilst I can access to the um, radiator lower hose clamp. Now, it is a little bit awkward, even, even though we've already taken off the battery. But all I'm doing is slackening off this clamp. We've already drained the coolant out. And in theory, this pipe should just slide off. But again, as is normally the case, when cars have been built for a long time, things tend to seize into place, even though 
There we are. So the clamp is now completely free. This is a nice stainless clamp. And you'll find that the pipe, the hose, tends to seize onto the seat, onto the steel pipe. What you can do is run a small screwdriver in between the two just to free it off. But access, of course, is as usual awkward. So I'm just running a small screwdriver just round where it was clamped to give, to hopefully free off the lower hose. And as soon as I've got it to move, which I have now, I'll now go across and take off the top hose. Okay, I'm now going to take off the top hose as part of the process of removing the radiator. So we've got one clamp there. Just of interest, there's two different designs of top hose, one of which has the thermostat in it, which this one is, and the later designs have the thermostat actually as part of the water pump housing. As usual, in this instance, the hose doesn't want to come off. And it's very much welded itself to the radiator. There we go. So here we have a thermostat in the top hose held with this clamp. Okay, so that's top hose off. Now I'm just going to undo the radiator mounts which are these two bolts at the front into captive nuts and they are particularly awkward to get at. You can get at them from below slightly but there's a lot of things in the way. Once again the later ones have actually got a slot cut into the end of the bolt so you can use a screwdriver to undo the bolt from above which is a nice useful time saving feature. Nice little ratchet spanner here, very useful. This now should be free enough for me to undo by hand. And pull the bolts through. The final bracket on the top, which supports the radiator, will also need to be undone. Um, final bolt is the radiator top clamp bolt, M5, and it is adjustable on the on the top bracket here, uh, which you may need to do when on assembly uh, to allow the fan to clear the shroud. So if you've got a noise on startup after you've refitted your radiator because the fan's hitting the shroud, this is the one to adjust. Okay, so. Everything's off and it's loose. I can now lift the radiator out through the front. With the final proviso that it's still slightly attached to this rear hose. Which is, of course, awkward. There we are. Come off now. And you have to lift it out front, clearing the hose. Here we go. We now have revealed the fan, which can now come off. We now have to take it off in order to get access to the, allow the steering rack to come out. You can get the rack out underneath, but this makes life easier if you just undo the four bolts that hold the fan onto the water pump. There are 10 mil AF sort of rather large self-tapping screws, if you like, because they screw into the plastic. Not like a thread. And there's four of them. And you can just move the fan around by hand if the tension on the belts is correct. 
do it one at a time. As they go into plastic, they won't need too much torque to tighten up. So there's the bolt. You can see it's just got a rather coarse thread. It's not like a bolt really at all. It's an overly large self-tapper, as I say. Move it around. And the safest place to put these, once you've taken them off, is back into the fan, just temporarily. They are unique to this application, so they don't fit anywhere else on the car, so that's why you need to keep these particular bolts with the fan. Okay, so we're removing the battery tray and we've got several fixings, the first of which is this one up here, which supports the battery, uh, sorry, the heater box that screws into the part of the bracket. You've got two fixings into the chassis down here, um, a slightly awkward one over here, which screws into this brace, and another awkward one underneath the tank at the bottom here, which goes through the chassis. I'm going to leave the tank, the reservoir, on attached to the um, tray as it makes makes it convenient. I'm not taking any of the pipes off and the whole thing will just swing around and pivot out of the way um, when we get onto the work. So, undoing this top one. It's a captive nut, so you just undo the bolt itself, but it does go through a rubber bush. There's actually part of this rubber bush is missing, which I'll replace when I refit this correctly later. It, there should be two halves, if you like, of the rubber bush and this has half of it missing. So the, the two bolts which support the back of the battery tray which go into the chassis are here. Uh, one of them is accessible with a socket, the other one under here isn't. So once it's slackened off with a spanner, if you, as soon as you can get your fingers onto it and undo it, it's quicker that way. They only need to be short bolts going in. There you are, there's one. This one's a bit more awkward, a bit stiffer. In fact, I shall change tools and go onto a socket. We go. Okay, the one at the front here. Again, it's not really accessible with a socket. And it's it's slightly pocketed, so a ring spanner might be an alternative. I'm not even getting a start on that one. So a ring spanner with an offset is what you need to get this one to start. But then I like to go to my ratchet to speed things up. And you should be able to get to a point where you can do it by hand. <laughs> I 
There we go. Now the awkward one. Okay, so here is the head of the awkward bolt. Now this is an instance where it isn't a captive nut. In fact, if ever there was a position to have it as a captive nut, this should have been it. So you need to get a spanner underneath to hold the nut. Which is awkward because I've left the re reservoir in place and you can hear it falling out. Oop. So now the nut is loose and I can now remove the bolt. So the whole tray is now loose and I will now pivot the whole thing around on the pipes that come from the bottom of the reservoir and it just will sit reasonably nicely out of the way there. Okay now I can get to the steering rack but first we have some wires and in this instance these will be the reversing light wires which can become disconnected easily and we have the speedo cable here which undoes the knurled nut here. And now we're moving on to the steering rack. We've got the steering arm, which is held on with this bolt here, which gets access to the clamp bolts that hold the rack in place but we also have to move the steering column out of the way and take off the clamp bolt there. And also the hydraulic feed pipe, which is these, this union here, and also the same on the other side. As this is an early car, uh, this clamp bolt is actually secured with a 16 mil AF nut, uh, whereas the bolt's just got a 14 mil head. Later ones have 14 both sides. So it's 16, not 17. I point that out because 16 is a slightly odd size. But once the nut is loose, you do have to slide the bolt right out on this one. It won't because the... the do you need to mark it? Too? Nope, you don't need to mark it. I'll explain that why. I'll explain it as I take it off. So once you've taken the, the clamp bolt out, the arm will or should just lift off on its splines. It might need to wheel it a bit. Now you'll have noticed that I haven't bothered marking it, and that is because you can't get it wrong. There's what we'd call a master spline, which means that this can only go on one way onto this particular arrangement. You can't get it slightly out. And uh, it'll be the same on the other side. We do have a very stiff ball joint here, which we will address later. But this now shows that we now have access to these two bolts which hold the clamp, which hold the um, rack in place. I'll now go around to the other side and slacken off the same ones. So here I'm just on the other side, once again. A 16 mil nut and a 14 mil bolt. Also on these ones, another little point, is that the nut itself, you'll see, has a slight shoulder. I don't know if the camera can pick that up. And that is the face that goes on to the tightening up face, rather than the other side, which doesn't. Just a little point, it will go the other way, but if you're being really technical, that's what you'd put it the right way. Again, that one pops off nice and easy. And in comparison, this has got a nice free ball joint. The one on the other side is um, a little tight. We'll have to look at that a little bit later. Right, so now we've got access to the bolts that hold the clamp bolts, but I want to go back to the other side to remove the steering column first. Right, the steering rack is held in with clamps at both sides, but it's also attached to the steering column here with this clamp bolt, uh, which we will undo in a moment. But also, there's a couple of other issues with the steering column, one, one of which is this spring here, which you can see has got a little bearing on it, and the bearing is uh, it hits this um, kidney-shaped cam device, which has got a little indent in this position, and that is the straight-ahead position for the steering, for when the car's going in a straight line. You can, you can adjust this cam, this kidney-shaped device, around the steering column once the car is set up to drive in a straight line. The idea is that this spring, spring helps give a little bit of feel to the steering and 
uh, will hold the car in the dead straight position. But we need to pull this out of the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a tie wrap, attach it to the box of the heater and just pull it sufficiently off the steering column like that. So it's now not contacting. Now I will undo the clamp bolts. Here is the steering column with the pinch bolt through. And what I've done is I've marked the, uh, the position of the slot onto the pinion of the steering rack uh, because I'm happy with the position of the steering column with where the, uh, the arm is. And so this will help when we put the column back onto the rack that we get it in the right position. This one's got a, a nylock nut on it, which is a non-standard, but perfectly acceptable replacement. Once again, this bolt has to come out all of the way before you can move the column. It's not just a clamp, but it's also, you can see there are ridges in the steering rack here where the bolt actually has to go through. Now that's not the final one to undo. There's, the whole column is spring loaded down towards the steering rack by a, a large diameter spring, which we'll sew later once we've got it apart, and a clamp which holds it in place. Now, unfortunately you won't be able to see there, but the clamp bolt is right up here. And I will slacken it off, and you just heard the spring releasing. So now, the steering column itself, I can move. Therefore, pull out the clamp bolt and slide the column. Hopefully I can slide it up enough against the spring tension to be able to get the steering rack out. I'm just going to see if I have to slacken off a bit more. And I can't, so <laughs> unfortunately that means I now have to go into the uh, passenger compartment and um, take off the coverings for the steering column and move the steering wheel out. So what I'm doing here is I need to remove this top cover in order to be able to pull the steering column away from the steering rack. I've already removed the, the pinch bolt, but because this is a, this is a pre-67 car, or pre it's a 60s car, so it has this design of dashboard. And the critical things to know here are that this chrome strip that goes around the steering column is one piece and it, is, it has to come out with the steering column. The other thing is it's very brittle and they have a great tendency to snap and they're very expensive and hard to come by. So when you're taking this apart, you have to be very careful. So we've got a screw either side of, the, uh, of this cowling cover. It's made of um, an aluminium stuff called Mazak, which is very, or relatively brittle, rather than proper aluminium. So that's why I'm going on about, you need to be very gentle. They're also, again, Mazak is not easy stuff to repair. You can glue it, but that's not really that good. Okay, that then just pops off slightly, like I've done here. And now you can lift off the top top cut half and slide it over the gear lever. And now we can see where this is the steering lock mechanism. And I'm just going to pull the steering column out towards me. Unhook this. Best after you move it up to this, then you can hook that out of the way. <laughs> I'm trying not to break it. And it's managing to catch itself on things, which of course it will do. And I only need to move it out just far enough to clear the steering column. Another half an inch would be nice. There we are. All right, now I'm going to put that back and gently leave it there and get out of the car. So here showing I have removed the steering column and there's now, it's now separated from the steering rack. And I'm now going to work in this area. We're going to get the alternator off. But first of all, we need to get some access. So the first thing, in order to get this battery holder out of the way, we need to remove this coolant pipe, which is going up to the heat up here. Now, having already drained the coolant system, this 
pops off. And that then allows, or should allow, me to hook this pipe out of the way. And also means that this battery tray holder, I'm hoping to be able to move the whole thing out of the way. That's a little bit, that's a little bit better than it was. Hmm, that's going to have to do. Okay, so now getting down to the dynamo. And we also will disconnect the This is the battery positive terminal, which goes down to the starter motor. I just want to type that out of the way. Again, this is all just really so I can get access down to the dynamo. Uh, dynamo, alternator, different. Uh, they're just only differences in where they're wired in. Similar ideas with three, three different wires. And the adjustment for the belts is a, is a similar setup as well. Color coded wires. So in theory, you can't get them wrong. Also, some of them are different diameter um, bolts. So again, to aid in not getting it wrong. I suspect this one at the end is seven mil, which it should be. So dashing for the right spanner. Being a 1960s car, the 60s DSs all have a problem with their wiring harnesses. What happens is that the black wires, there was obviously a fault or the manufacturer of the insulation of all the black wires uh, deteriorates. And it, can, it, becomes, it becomes, can become like dust, it becomes so bad. So you end up with wires that have no coating on them and this can happen in the middle of the wiring harness. Everything's fine so long as the, the wires aren't disturbed but if they're in that bad condition and you then wiggle them around the insulation breaks off completely and you can end up having a direct short. The solution which is unfortunately an expensive one is complete replacement of the wiring harness um, and that really is the only option. But it only seems to happen on the on the black coated wires. Any ones that are coloured, that doesn't seem to happen. Right, so now we've taken the wires off the dynamo. I now have to slacken off the mounting bolts. So and so this is the adjusting nut. It's incorrect as a nylock, but it does a perfectly good job. But what is in fact missing is that it should be a square washer in here which would spread the load. We'll replace that with the right washer when we come back to it. And the other nut is a 13 mil. And again, it doesn't have a it doesn't have the right washer on it, but we'll sort that out at the end. So getting the uh, tensioning bracket off. So now we just have the main main pivot bolts. Now they are awkward because it's a Citroen and you probably won't be able to see on this but so in order to get access to the uh, dynamo mounting bolts it's the same on the on the alternators on the later cars this really is a very awkward nut. Now I've got a, a 14 mil ratchet spanner and that's probably the most ideal one to get onto it and as you can see even though we've taken the radiator off and everything, still access is limited. Now, at least Citroen did things help slightly in that you only have to slacken this front bolt off because the bracket for the alternator is actually a U section and it will slide off once we've taken the bolt out of the other side, which is directly opposite to the other end of the dynamo and which again, of course, you can't see. And you won't, I mean, I don't, I can't even see it myself. So, right, to get to the 
rear mounting bolt on this car, or, or in fact any DS, it is really awkward and you will struggle to actually even see it. I have actually managed to crack that one off. Now this, the rear bolt has to be removed completely to free off the uh, dynamo or alternator. But not on this particular one, so I've just been informed. So I only have to slacken it and it will come straight off. Gosh, that's easy. So with that new knowledge, We'll just move the dynamo out of the way so I can get the belts off, take the tension off the belts. We will be replacing these belts anyway. And then the dynamo just lifts out. And there you have the slots in the mounting points. The current owner has made that one so that it is a salt slot as well. Makes it easy to get it off, but it means that there's slight less security. There's a possibility that the dynamo could move if the bolt wasn't tight. Okay, now we can remove this lower hose, which is only really so that we can get access, it gives us easier access to the steering rack, uh, and also down to the, the handbrake pads. So I'll take off the top clamp, leaving the short hose connected to the uh, lower steel pipe. And as I've already disconnected this end up at this, the heater, all we do is work it out. Now, because it's the lower hose, it will have some water in it, coolant. So what I suggest you do is, as you're aware it's got coolant in it, you just gently take it off, keep the coolant in it, and then pour the water all over the car at a later date. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. Luckily that'll get cut. <sighs> okay, now we're down to the steering rack. Now you can see it's much easier to see what we're looking at. And we're down to just taking off the main clamps at either side and also the um, feed, fluid pressure in and return, which is on this clamp here. We'll take that one off next. When we come to put the steering rack back in, I will explain all the settings. But in the uh, instance of when you're taking a rack out, and if you don't have the right tools, which I would strongly suggest you do have, but if you don't have, you're slightly um, constrained by what you can do. Uh, what one, of the, one of the adjustments is actually a measurement from the centre line here to the centre line of the steering rack column there, rack. And this, this dimension is 120 millimetres plus or minus, well, it's 122 and a half plus or minus and a half which is 120 to 125 so you've got a, a five mil tolerance of where the rack actually fits into this clamp here uh, you'll see that there's it's got serrations on it that's actually a very fine thread and in the clamp on both sides is an equivalent thread so that when the rack goes into position it doesn't move uh, front uh, side to side it's actually clamped in place so if you haven't got the right tool you can use a marker to mark where the rack is in terms of its orientation and also its axial position relative to the clamps. Now, when you're marking it, there's not much point in marking this outer cap because you're taking the cap off. So put the marker onto the main part of the steering relay here, like this. So what you're doing is you're marking both the rack and the, and the um, steering relay in the same relative position. Also, you're filling up the little grooves of uh, thread, if you like, uh, and the ones underneath will be clear, so that should therefore mark very clearly where the rack is. Obviously you want to let that dry, and you can do it on both sides, but you only actually really need to do it on one. Um, as I say, we will cover this when I come and reinstall the rack later on. Okay, I've now got to take off the hydraulic feed line, which is two M8, M, uh, sorry, M5 nuts clamping the hydraulic uh, it's the hydraulic feed in and feed out of the rack and you have a sandwich plate which has two little o-ring seals in it which you must not lose of 
course, prior to this, there's no pressure in the hydraulic system at the moment, but if you're doing this solely as this job, you would make sure that the pressure is relieved on the regulator and that you've worked the steering black and white to make sure there's no pressure left, residual pressure left in the system. I do expect a little bit of uh, hydraulic fluid to come out as I drop it. There we go. When it will drip down, residual pressure. And the bracket just slides off the studs. And I will also slide off the sandwich plate. Here we go. And the sandwich plate here, as you see, has two rubber O-rings, which are actually the ones that seal the pressure feeds into the rack. Don't lose this plate. Put it somewhere very safe. OK, now we're ready to undo the main clamp bolts. And on this car, again, because of its age, most of the nuts clamping it will be 12 mil AF, even though they're M7s with a 12 mil head. All later cars from 67 onwards should have, or were originally left factory with, 11 mil AF heads on the M7s. The bolts themselves are interchangeable, but that was, there was a change made at that point obviously decided to save money by making the heads one millimetre smaller or to save weight or both. So you undo these bolts completely and remove the, remove the bolts and the, the cap. And there's the bolts out. And I'll just prise the cap off with a screwdriver and you'll see that the inside of the cap is also threaded, if you like, uh, which engages with the thread on the, on the rack. Right, we just move to the other side. And do the same thing. Okay, now that the clamps are off, the rack is now free. I just need to give it a slight twist and it pops out the clamps and we can lift the whole thing out and up and away. The rack is now off. Okay, now while we're at it, we may as well take off the, the drive belts as these ones are going to be replaced anyway. V belts, and we can now we now have access to the handbrake cable, and uh, we will be taking the this, the main cam pulley off, and we have access to the access to the uh, parking brakes, which we can also remove. Looking on this particular car, looks like the. This is the parking brakes return spring, which is not looking in great shape. Might even be the right, doesn't look like the right size. Whereas this one is straight and it's um, correctly orientated. There is a special tool, another special tool, which is used when removing, when removing these springs. This is it, it's like a big pair of scissors. And these clamp bits here just aid the removal or compressing of the springs when you're taking off the handbrake cable, like that. Now, what we do to take the cable off first is I have to slacken off the cable itself uh, in order to be able to pull the end, the end of it out there first before I can take it off. It has to come, end has to come out and then we put the whole thing out that way. 
And on this car, the adjuster is under this panel. So I have to remove this panel. So I've removed this, uh, the inner splash guard, in order to get to the adjustment for the handbrake cable so that we can then take the cable off itself. So what there is, is you've got a, a double lock nut arrangement and I just need to, and they're 21 mil AF nuts, so you know, and ideally you need two spanners. And once they are loose, once you've loosened off the lock nut one, in theory, you should be able to do it by hand. Now this is with the handbrake mechanism already loose. It's the, you know, the handbrake's not on. You can't do it if it's tight. And all I'm trying to do here is get enough slack into the cable such that I can pull the end off the actual caliper and then get the springs out. So I can then get the cable off so we can get the engine out. I'll be resetting this obviously when we come to refit the engine back into the car. So undo the nuts and push the adjuster in as far as it will go. There we go, that's as far as it wants to go. And now I should be able to pull the end of the cable out of the caliper. Okay, now that I've taken the adjuster for the handbrake cable, it's all loose at that end, using a mole wrench or similar clamp, I clamp on the nipple of the cable at the free end, and I want to pull it free, and it will now come up through this slot here. But we have a problem, and that is, I want to get this, this tool which compresses that spring, but I can't get it because you've got this pipe in the way. So, we're going to have to backtrack slightly and remove this pipe. It's already disconnected at this end, it actually comes from the caliper and it goes up to the centrifugal regulator. So all I've got to do is release its clamp, clamp bolt. And then the nipple, where right, it goes into the caliper. Oh, blimey. Of course. Dear me, it doesn't want to come undone. Uh. Oh. <laughs> Typical. Aren't we glad we rehearsed this shot? This is going to prove to be a little bit more difficult. So they're designed to take a lot of heat and therefore dissipate heat. And there's also fluid and you know, there's a lot of things taking the heat away from this area. It's always difficult to know if it's ever hot enough. Let's just give it a try. That's all you can do. But I don't want to try and trouble is if I work too hard I'll round the thing off and then we will be. I might have to end up making up. There we are. That's right, it's done it. Okay. So I've just cracked, managed to crack off this pipe union. And I'm just going to put on some release agent just to help. Now we've got it moving. Work it a bit because it's still a bit stiff. Doesn't really want to, and it'll get easier as you work it. Here we go. This again is going to dribble a bit of LHS, so I'll catch it. So once you're happy you've got it unscrewed as far as it's going to go, like that, you'll still find that the pipe may be stiff in the, in the housing. Just needs a little bit of 
moving around to free it off whilst you pull it out. Yes, this one is being pretty recalcitrant. <laughs> okay, so I've managed to get the pipe to come out and I can now take it off the other end as well, which is where it was difficult to come off earlier. I'll hook it and then feed it through. And what we've got here is what is probably the reason why it was giving me such a hard time is that there doesn't appear to be any rubber seal. Either the rubber seal would fit on the end of the pipe there, just next to the swage, or it would still be in the in the caliper. But there is no rubber seal in this particular case. So someone has either forgotten to put it in and has made it seal by tightening it up so tight that it distorts the steel. So obviously a bodge, which we won't do when we put it back together again. So now we've got that pipe out of the way. I can now use my spring compressing tool to get into this handbrake spring. So I will pull the cable out as far as it'll go and un unhook it and then compress the spring. And in theory, <laughs> again, perhaps we should practice this again. In theory, it should pop free of the caliper like that. I can then release the cable from the clamp, take the spring out, which is slightly bent and we might replace that. There's the cable out this end and it's the same at the other end. It should, I keep, I keep using the word should. Okay. <laughs> this is actually seized in. That's why it's not being very cooperative. The cable in theory, now I've released it, should just slide out of the caliper. You notice I use the word should, and it's not doing it on either of those. I'm going to have to try a different tool. Okay, now I've managed to free this end of the cable off, and <laughs> it should just slide out. What I'm going to do is put a bit of lubricant on it, just to help. And I'm making a lot more weather on this than I should be. Just gently want to clamp that, don't want to crush the cable. And it is a bit corroded. And you will see that this, this portion just fits into the slot there. Now there's a bit of metal missing, which is that should have a little tang sticking up, which aligns with this tang to stop the cable rotating. Now it's the same at the other end. And this one also is seized at this end, so I'm going to work it a little bit. I've already put a bit of lubricant on it. Just move it slightly and work it. And whilst I'm doing it, I'm pulling the cable. And there we have it loose. Now I come back to my special tool for compressing the spring. I want to get it in as near to the end as possible to get the maximum throw. And there we are, compress it. And of course it pops off. <laughs> Brilliant. Meanwhile, the cable almost comes out. And now this is a complete mess and so we're going to have a lot of fun trying to compress the spring in a way that the tool wasn't designed for. But we are going to succeed. There we go. I can now release the spring. So, springs now, you can slide the spring off the cable. And now we can also see that one's actually quite nice and free, right? So the cable, the inner part of the cable is not seized to the outer, which is all good news. Uh, I will lubricate, clean this up and lubricate it before we put it back on. The final job is to take the end of the cable off the final one of the caliper. I'm going to assume that it's slightly seized because the other ones were. And yes, it 
feels a bit stiff but not perhaps too bad a little bit of lubricant perhaps just to aid matters and there we go cables now completely off and we'll tuck it out of the way handbrake parking brake should I say is now mechanism calipers are now free and we can see how they all are slightly out of adjustment okay now we're moving on to removal of the LHM or in this case the hydraulic pump should I say LHS in this case right so we're now going to take off the hydraulic pump so we've got uh, adjusting bar here you see with the elongated slot which gives you the tension on these belts I uh, will ignore the fixings because they're all slightly wrong we will correct those when we come to reinstall the thing so first off we've got this adjusting nut which is a nylock nut in this instance. Again, an aftermarket, not a bad upgrade if you like. Being Citroen, you will of course find that there are different nuts at each end, partly because they're different bolts. This is an M7 stud, this is an M8, so of course they've got different size nuts. This is the first one this is correct in that it has square washer which is the correct fitting in this application so that's the adjuster off we already have the um, uh, pipe disconnected at the other end but we'll disconnect the, the actual pipe itself here but before we do that we're going to disconnect the feed pipe which in this case is a lovely stainless steel item and this is a uh, 12 mil AF pipe union and right next to it is the main mounting bolt which normally would be a 14 AF and that looks like a 13 to me and it is so that's the wrong bolt and it is not a captive nut at the other end and luckily I can hold it by hand okay that's the nut off this is now free and again it'll probably dribble LH hydraulic fluid shall I say now the problem with the incorrect bolt is that it's not the right diameter and so the pump tends to roll around this is the diameter that was the wrong size I'll put a correct one in when we install it push it away to get the bolts the belts undone take the tension off the belts pop off the pipe which will now come out and the final thing which I should have done earlier of course was to remove the clamp for the hose once again doing it out of sequence the other alternative which I've just considered is to take the hose with the pump which means moving that out of the way first now the reason for this is I want to uh, this clamp at the top of the engine here is actually what we're going to lift the engine and gearbox out with it's the official um, hoist hook if you like and it is slightly shrouded by this bracket which also um, mounts the radiator so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bracket off this bracket off but reinstall the engine hoist hook so that we can then lift the engine out it looks like no it's just 
this nut's just fouling the distributor clamp, but I can get to it. Also in this car, the earth lead has been attached at this point, which again I will reposition when we come to reinstall the engine in the car. So as is usual, in this disassembly process, um, there are various ways that this car has been put back together again, which is not as Citroen would have intended. Um, they do work, but I will be putting it back as close to how Citroen did it, because that's what I'm used to. And it's essentially the right way. Now this clamp I'm just showing you here, slightly bent, this is, you'll be amazed to know, the only thing that will lift the whole engineer gearbox out. And it's only supported by two M8 nuts. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it does actually do the job. The nuts do need to be tight. I haven't said that. So now I've got the, I'll take this out of the way now I've done it. So there's the pipe with the LHM, with the hydraulic pump, I'll remove it. Okay, so coming back to this clamp, putting the hook back on. Looks like another the other set of gloves. Managed to go through the thumb on this one. Okay, that's tight enough. Right, the next thing we miss is when we're down here is in order to get these belts off, the V-belts that actually uh, drove the uh, hydraulic pump, we can't take them straight off because the clutch operating mechanism goes right through the middle of them. So what we have to do is to slacken off this adjuster bolt, which is on the end of the uh, uh, forearm. So this is this is the clutch operating mechanism. And in this particular instance, of course, having not looked at it before, the bolt is right tight, right the way in, 14 mil. A bit of lubricant on the thread will be useful. And this has to come all the way out. So it then becomes disconnected and we can then get the V-belts off. This also in indicates to me that there may be a problem with the clutch. Although this car was driving fine when it came in, the fact that this adjustment was right on the end of its adjust, right as far as it could go, uh, could be that the clutch is on its last legs. And it's another reason why we're taking the engine and gearbox out so that we can check the clutch. We'll do it as a matter of course. So having slackened the adjuster right off, I also note there's another piece missing off this, which is to do with the return spring. The return spring in this instance has been hooked into a hole at the back here, but officially there should be a little clip, little bracket, which is missing, which would hold this spring in. Again, it was working, but it's incorrect. Taking the spring off, I then disconnect the uh, the clutch, this is the clutch slave cylinder, there's a push rod in the middle of it and because I've got that out I can now feed the belts through. So you can see how awkward this is and we have most of the car apart. Trying to change these belts when everything is still on it is really quite awkward so that's why it's always good at practice when you're at this stage if you have any doubt over the belts change them as a matter of course. Now these are old they're not terrible, but I would change them, as I say, as a matter of course. Wouldn't bother fitting those back in again. Okay. And having now taken off the hydraulic pump and the belts, uh, we've already got uh, the heat shield off the exhaust. So we're, we're just looking around the car to see if there's anything still that would connect the engine to the engine to the chassis. And apart from the engine mount bolts, which are at the back there, 
and we've got three here supporting this bracket. There is nothing else taken off the, uh, hand, the cable, the drive shaft's off. So all the way around now, we're now here at this area with this, as it's being a, a hydraulic car, we now need to disconnect the gear change pipes, which go to the top of the gearbox, and also the brake pipes, which are also fed from this side. So there's going to be a lot of fluid around and a lot of finagling to get these pipes out. So I'll start by disconnecting this union block here on the side of the gearbox. And what we have is there are, they are M6, so they're 10 mil AF nuts. And there will be a bit of dribblage. I've got a catch tray at the bottom. This particular, it's the same on the later cars. You have two studs, so you have two nuts sticking out and a bolt, which hold this triangular plate on. This plate, this plate uh, has all the pipes which uh, are pressurized from the brain hydraulic brain up on the bulkhead, which select which gears to be engaged, depending on which one of these pipes has pressure in it. Once again, in this application, we actually have two unions, and between each of them is a sandwich plate. So there's a sandwich plate there, which will have O-rings in it, and another sandwich plate there, uh, before you get onto the main block of, mounted onto the side of the gearbox. And as a matter of course, if you're ever taking one apart, it's good practice to change the O-rings because they become flat over time. And in this car, as it's an LHS car, again, the O-rings are different from LHM ones, material's different, and uh, you have to ensure you don't fit the wrong ones. So there we have the, this is now loose and I should be able to just work it off. There will be a little bit of spillage and I'm going to displace the sandwich plate. And there you have it. This one's a little bit black, but you can see the five O-rings in the plate. They will push out. I wonder if I can just push one out by hand now. Let's try using a nut, a bolt. Right, these feel quite hard, and you would expect that if this has been in a car for quite some time. So once again, these probably won't seal when you put them back in, and therefore it's always good practice to change them. Right, also while we're here, we also see that this, this is the reversing light switch, and these are the reversing wires and they are attached to the hydraulics so that's fine we can disconnect those as well. The speedo cable which is this little darling can stay with the gearbox because it's attached to that there end or we could take it off and we have a return pipe here which goes around to the clutch lock which is just a low pressure return is not on any kind of clamp and so it should pull off and thread its way through. And I'll tuck it up here into the tank where hopefully it will stay. Okay, what else have we got down here? Well, we have a little wiring harness. Sorry, just dropped a spanner. This little wiring harness is one that connects to all the brake pads. It's the early warning, or the warning, saying your brake pads are worn out and it, we could leave it on the gearbox but I'm going to take it off. I need to clip through where it's been attached. Again, quite a lot of working on these cars is to gain access and to taking parts off so you can actually see what you're doing because quite a lot of the time there's a lot of things in the way. Now we've also got here two pipes which are the brakes. Uh, this doesn't look like this has been installed as it should be from Mr Citroen. It's a bit loose and it's in the wrong position but once again that'll all be sorted out when I come back to reinstall it later. 
We've also got a clutch uh, lockout pipe, uh, which is this pipe here. Again, it's, it's not been bent in the right place, but it does have a union here. And I need to be able to disconnect that. And I'll need a... Uh, unfortunately, being a Citroen, they've put it such that it's right under the support bracket. But no matter. The standard phrase, it's a Citroen, sir, often comes to mind. Oh, Mom, that's a 12. Bit of corrosion on this one, but now it's moving. Put a bit of release agent on it. As soon as it's loose, you can then work it backwards and forwards to help free it off before you undo it further. I thought I could, could get it with my hands, but can't. And once again, I have to work the pipe to, to split it. We have a, the pipe, we may as well take the pipe off completely, just again, not because we need to, but because it is just in the way and could easily become damaged uh, because of what it is. So this is, I'm just going to remove the pipe, just to get it out of the way and give me easier access to the brake pipes. So this device over here on the side of the gearbox, this is the clutch lockout device, which is, has been installed. What it does is it prevents the clutch from re-engaging if the gearbox is not in either first or second gear. So if you're, if, you, if it's misshifted and hasn't selected, correctly selected either of those gears, this device will prevent the clutch from engaging. So Citroen must have discovered at some point that they needed to put it in uh, because there must have been some kind of error. And it only, only occurs, of course, in a hydraulic. Take forever to undo this nut. Again, if this was a, if this was a Toyota or probably German, they would, you'd never be in this situation. There would always be enough clearance to get a ring spanner or a socket on it. But no, I mean, okay, we might say that perhaps this is an aftermarket reversing light switch and it's slightly more bulky and therefore it's impeding where this bolt is put. But this is characteristic of the differences between um, different manufacturers, shall we say. And then of course it had been German, they would never built the car in the first place. Okay, so I'm trying to, want to free off this pipe it doesn't want to come off. Oh, it looks like I'm actually going to have to take the reversing light switch off because it's actually forcing, it's so attached on the clamp there. I am. I'm going to have to take the reversing light switch off. Never mind. Simple. That should just unscrew, but it's 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 foul it's fouling the clamp. Yes. Here we go. And now I can take the clamp off. We might have to do something about that when we come to reinstall it. Okay, so the pipe is now in theory loose. Is, they're all becoming rather, they don't want to come out, do they? You're going to tell me there's no seal in there, aren't you? Shall we have a look? Shall we have a look through the round window? Actually, it doesn't look like there's a seal in there. It doesn't look very healthy, though. 
Right, so pipe, awkward shape, out of the way. To remove the brake pipe, this one that goes on top of the gearbox, I'm going to take the pipe out complete as a unit. So, first of all, slacken off the union. I don't know if that one actually undid. It may well have distorted. Ah, this may be, we may have the same issue as this end. I'll tell you what, let's change tack slightly. What I'm going to do is take the pads out first, just to do it again for give myself a bit more room. So in this instance, the pads are sliding out nicely. Yep, yeah, that's a lot of meat on that. Not not textile, but again, nothing wrong with that pad. Sliding out nicely. Yep, about half worn. And now we'll just I'll give it another go. If you look, see how far that union is down compared mm. to that one or this one. Do you see that? Yeah. I suspect that that one hasn't got a seal in it, so it's been rammed in, much like this one has on this corner. And therefore, it's seized and we're going to have to be a bit more. And the additional problem being LHS car, of course, is that um, generally with LHS and steel, you end up with rust. So the two, it really isn't, it's not nice stuff. It's probably my, my real main criticism of Citroen is they didn't change the fluid years earlier. I realized that in the 50s you were struggling for a hydraulic fluid and so you, they went for brake fluid. But they probably could have, if they'd changed, the, changed it to LHM many times sooner. On the other hand, you could say that hooray to Citroen for actually changing it to LHM when they did, rather than keeping it LHS all the way. Okay, so I suspect this one's going to be equally recalcitrant. I'll take the mounting securing bolts off the top. On, what I'll do is just slip that back on there. Again, interestingly, this is again Citroen. They fitted the star washer under the bracket, which is interesting, rather than under the nut. You can actually do it both ways, but we can go with the Citroen way. Okay, so, work the pipe. Worst case scenario is it will shear the pipe off. Luckily I can make one other one up. This is feeling like it might be doing that. Because it doesn't want to come out at all. All I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, there's a union in the brake pipe circuit. And I'm, I'm splitting the union so I can remove the pipe that attaches to the gearbox across to the, the uh, offside caliper. And I'm taking it off at this end. There's a separate pipe right next to it, which is, goes to the near side caliper. And I'll do that one after I've done this one. 
but given that you can only get the spanner on to do an eighth of a turn at a time and then turn the spanner around, put it back on, and it has to be an open ender because it's over a pipe, that is why it takes time. Somebody has invented the ratchet open ender. I think I do have one somewhere. It sort of doesn't quite live up to its name, but it sort of does. But you can see why someone went all the trouble of trying to invent one. Right, hopefully, I'll be able to undo that by hand. Nope. Pipes off. Okay. Now, because I've already disconnected this, I should be able to unhook that. And there is the brake pipe off. I'll take the uh, I'll take the pads out while we're at it. So, unclip this securing clip if you like. Feed the wires through, and the pads should just slide out, which they do, and that one's quite nice and clean, about half worn, not a problem. This one, again, wearing well, about half, slightly more than half worn, but that's absolutely fine. I'll see if I can just get that clip off. Okay, this gives us, so we can see a bit clearly, so I'm now undoing this clamp I've already slackened off, off this clamp nut here. So undo the nut and just unclip the, the pipe. And I'm going to put the nut back on so I don't lose it. And now I'm going to slacken off the union where it goes into the caliper, which is up here. I already have a drip tray underneath the car to catch any hydraulic fluid that I'm going to spill. And this side is easy to undo, so I reckon it has got the correct seal in it and won't be an issue. Can I undo it by hand is the next question. Yes. Okay. Again, a little, that's all it should need, a little wiggle of the pipe and then it should pop off. So that's now free at that end. What I'm going to do is to take it off at the other end, again, just to make life easier in the long run. So down here, once again, that should be now free. There we go, that's popped off nice and easy. All I've got to do now is cut the tie wrap and this pipe with a little bit of jiggery pokery should lift out. But I'm not quite sure, it looks like it's been bent over all kinds of ways. <coughs> yep, 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 there we are. A bit awkward, but the pipe is now out. It's the wrong shape. Bend it to the right shape when we come to put it back in again. There's going to be a lot of reshaping pipes. Okay, so we're now disconnected here. We disconnected here. So moving round, the next bit to disconnect is we've got this pipe here, which goes up to the um, brake uh, activated slow running speed on the same side of the carburetor. So that has to come off. And then we've also got the fuel line and also the, uh, the hydraulic feed from the regulator to the chassis. I've got, here I'm going to take off, this is the return line uh, from the CRC up here next to the carburetor. And this one hasn't got a clamp on it, so it should just pull off, which it does. 
tuck it out of the way. Next we've got a fuel line which is here on this clamp which I'll take off at the fuel pump. I'm making my life slightly awkward. There we go. And again this is under suction so it shouldn't be a problem. And that is petrol. So it's quite a good idea to put a bung such as a bolt into the end of that uh, the fuel line to stop it leaking petrol anywhere which of course could be a fire hazard that's not a big enough bolt glad I had one to hand of course ready for filming and now the return from the uh, regulator this goes straight back to the reservoir so when the regulator cuts in and out, uh, the excess from the pump is just returned under no pressure to the reservoir. And it's, see how tight it is, very tight. The clamp's completely loose. God, Bennett. It shows you the real life situation whereby we haven't rehearsed this, we're just doing it straight and you will often come across things that don't want to come apart and of course there is little access, there we go, it's now off, little access to actually get to them. Again, I want to tuck that out of the way. Okay, next one we have, next one to take off is we've got this pipe which goes all the way down to the brake caliper, which uh, attaches at the other end to the um, slow running control on the carburetor. What I'm going to do is move this out of the way so we can slowly get access to what I'm actually aiming at. It's all very complicated around here, but this pipe here is the one I'm going to be disconnecting. You see it goes all the way down to the caliper. So I'll take it off at the caliper this is an aftermarket pipe that someone else has fitted. It should actually be clamped into there, but no matter, it's working. And as this is a later pump, I'm hoping that the union will undo easily. It's not bad. We've got a made-up Kunafer pipe, which is fantastic. The union used on this end, though, is a mild steel one and has corroded. It's always better when you're making up pipes if you can use stainless unions because they won't corrode and neither will the, cop the Cooper pipe. And so you won't have issues in future. But of course, as with anything, there's a cost implication. And he you pays your money and he you takes your choice. That should be nearly out. There we are. And there's a seal still in place. Now we'll take it off here. Well, this is loose anyway. <laughs> oh well. I'm just checking to see where else is this particular pipe has been attached. And it doesn't look like it's attached at all. Oh, apart from where it now goes into the, the valve that operates the brake. Uh -huh. Again, access is typical Citroen style. Awkward, difficult, everything else is in the way. And in theory, you have to take everything else off before you can actually get to this. But that is normal. Um, okay, there's that pipe off. But now I see we're going to have to do something with all this up here. Uh, basically, we may as well just snip it all off. We can reconnect these later. Uh-huh. 
So disconnecting the connections for the one, two, three, the electronic ignition to the coil. We'll be leaving the coil in place, but the distributor will come with the engine. King lead off as well. Slip it through here, the bracket. Right, again, we'll stay with the engine. Okay. Now, I think we may as well take off this fuel line because it's in the way. Not a bad idea having a fuel filter up here because it's easy access, but it does mean you have to put a load more pipes in to uh, actually get it into that position. These look like. Okay. So, fuel off the carburetor. stiff and doesn't want to come apart. There we go. Are you coming off? extra aftermarket fuel filter off. Okay, now we should be at this pipe. Uh, it's just connected down, it's been tie wrapped off. Should, in theory, come out. Come on, you. What's up? There we go. Just got to remember where that pipe goes. Hee. Along with all the others. All right, so we're slowly getting towards separating the car from the chassis. We've got this pipe here. Oh, still not loose enough. Slight bend out of the way. And now the main pressure feed from the from the regulator, despite the fact I'm going to get dripped on. Oh, 
I'd done this the other way up, I wouldn't be being dripped on. But hey ho, a mechanic's life is never simple. Well, that one came out nice and easy. So that's that one out of the way. Okay, we've now got this one here, which should go across to the um, centrifugal regulator, which we took off, already taken off. So in order to free that pipe, we're going to have to do a little bit of clearing up. I'll take off the distributor cap, actually, in this instance, along with all the leads. Okay, so this pipe here, again, comes apart at this junction. Reach for the spanner I just put down and lost. Now we also have a connection here where it's bolted onto the side of the CRC. Okay, we're coming on. So we've now disconnected all the hydraulic lines and the electrical lines from the chassis to the car, uh, chassis to the engine on this side. Uh, right, well, we've now got the throttle linkages at the top and then we're down to the engine mounts, which are down here. So I'm going to disconnect the choke cable first and then the accelerator, the throttle linkage um, next. So what we've got is we've got a little clamp here, clamp for the cable, which you can undo either with a spanner or with a screwdriver. Again, just slacken it off, cable comes out. And we've got the clamp on the end of the choke lever here. It's got an eight mil, um, sort of bolt on the inside which you can hold an 8 mil spanner before you undo it so you can then slide the cable out and ideally you want to tuck that away somewhere okay now the throttle linkage first of all we disconnect these springs by unhooking them and just letting them drop down like that and the throttle rod will come through and be detached now we've got these two nuts here which hold the throttle rod support and they are not the size I have for my spanner <laughs> which is they're non-standard not a problem ah oh, yes okay that's interesting so again this is a non-standard there should be a special little clamp bolt that holds this rod in but it's held in with two separate bolts which aren't captive so that gives us a little bit of an issue but luckily they they undo quite easily I don't I'm not too bothered to drop them. Come on. There we go. So there's the throttle rod support. And at the front, undoing the nuts, or well, we'll be undoing the nuts, holding the throttle linkage on. Mm. 
Normally this would be double nutted um, with a washer, but this has been modified such that you have a single nylock nut fitted. Again, perfectly good, more modern upgrade if you like. And I'm sure if nylock nuts had been invented when Citroen were building this car, they would have fitted them. That's one nearly. One off. There we go. So here comes the throttle linkage with the support, which just slides off the end. This is a rubber rubber bush. Oh, sorry, it's a brass brass bush sitting in a rubber housing to allow us a bit of flexibility. And this is a very common failure the rubber perishes and then the bush drops. But this is a, a recent change, recent new part. Okay, so we've now disconnected just about everything around the, uh, around the car. I have an extra pipe here, which I don't recognize. Uh, so we're now down to um, loosening off all the engine mounts on all four corners. So we're now going to undo the bolts for the rear engine mount. Uh, I've already taken off the sphere here, so we've got, you can access and see what we're actually doing. Um, this is, of course, tricky. So I use a long extension here with a flexible end. And the, the front one there is relatively easy to get at. You've got captive nuts at the bottom of the mount, so we don't have to worry about the nuts. But the tricky one is the rear bolt, which I'm about to demonstrate, in that you can't actually see it and it's difficult to get the socket on. So I will just put my hand behind here and help the socket onto the nut, onto the bolt. In this instance, we're on a left-hand drive car and it's much more accessible to be able to get at this bolt. On a right-hand drive car with a steering column and all the other paraphernalia in the way, it really is very tricky. So, you can take the bolts right out, and that is the bolt, that's now ready, the engine will now lift up. So these are the th three bolts that hold the gearbox top mount onto this side of the chassis, and there's three on the other side. These two wires here are the wires that control the self-leveling mechanism for the headlights. You've got a stiff wire that goes, one goes all the way to the back, which is this one, uh, which goes to the anti-roll bar at the back and this lower one here goes to the, oh, sorry, it's all the way around. This is the front one and that's the rear one. And they link together and then control the action of the headlight. But one of the mounting bolts just holds the bracket, holds the outer of this front cable. out and you can just slightly displace this a bit and tuck the wire underneath because this bar is going to come up with the engine and we want to leave the uh, self-leveling mechanism wire with the chassis. Okay that's it loose this side we now move on to the other side. So now moving on to the engine mount on this side this is the inlet side and that being the engine mount Again, the bolts are awkward to get at. At least you can see this front one. Uh, 
and again it's again quite easy to you don't really want to drop the bolt so once I've loosened it off I'll take it off by hand eventually get my hand out there we go okay so coming in to, to get the rear bolt for the engine mount on this side I'm taking a torch and I'm actually going to put the torch down there so it's shining roughly in the eye in the way where I want to be because it is so difficult to see and then I'm feeding my socket in with three extensions on it and I can just see the head of the bolt there we are on it and now I can undo the bolt. We shall see how we get on with when we've got to put this bolt back in when the engine is going back together again. That's going to be another story. So I can feel that's, feel that's now free. And with any luck, the bolt will come out with the socket, which it has done. There we go. Okay, the engine is now free and we can now pull it out of the car. So we now have the hoist in position here, as you can see, and the hook is onto the, this little bracket, which is all I'm going to use to lift this engine and gearbox out. I know it doesn't look much, but that is the standard correct fitting to do it. I've got this uh, hoist over a slight uh, on the side, because my particular hoist isn't quite long enough to go directly from the front. And, and you can see, because this, uh, it allows the uh, gearbox, ending gearbox unit to balance nicely as you're lifting it out. And I'm just checking that we've got everything is loose. What will normally happen as we're trying to take the engine and gearbox out is that you will find that the exhaust downpipe on this side will catch on the cross member underneath. So I'm just going to be doing a bit of wiggling to make sure everything's free. And we've got to sort of go up and then out and up and out in that kind of way. Now I can bring to swing my hoist round. That's it. Making sure that it's not held in with anything and everything is disconnected. Yes. So it's got to come at quite an angle that the rocker cover has to clear the bulkhead so I just gently go up check that everything's right and now I can pull the car out pull the engine out and we've still got I can still feel the exhaust it's just touching the cross member now it's completely free Go up a bit more, because I've got to clear the bumper. And now forward towards me. Another person, of course, would be always useful just to steady the engine and gearbox. So I know it does look precarious, but this is how you do it. It will tend to swivel because of the, my particular hoist. Again, it's not an issue as long as it's not going to hit anything. And it, of course it just touches the thing here. Keep going up. That should clear the bumper. And there we are, engine and gearbox out. I'm now going to lower it down onto the ground. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple of blocks under the sump of the engine because the downpipe is lower than the bottom of the sump and you can't just put it straight on the ground there. So a couple of chunks of wood for the engine to sit on. There we go. And it will come down and just sit on the sump and then also on the discs at the front, like that. 
And of course it's now going to be dribbling coolant out because we have it at a slightly different angle and I haven't drained the block, which is a job I of course should have done earlier. And forgot, but we'll now do. So disconnect the hoist, slide it out of the way. And there we have the engine out.